this is uh, lecture 5 on urban transportation planning. We will discuss about a set of important conceptual aspects related to the planning process in this lecture. Before we proceed further, as we normally do, let us try to recollect what we did in the previous class. You may recall, first we try to understand that the effect of the growth in the travel intensity which can be seen in the field is in the form of traffic and transportation problems in the cities and towns. We also realized planning is a prerequisite to provide solution to these problems. Then we try to understand the definition of the term planning and then we went on to look at the contents of the course. Now you are clear that this course will be covered under 10 different topics. Finally, I gave you a set of 8 reference books and you also know now which are the chapters in each of these books are relevant to this particular course. Still, to make ourselves very clear, to make ourselves sure that we have really recapitulated the important aspects of the previous lecture, let us pose a set of questions as recapitulation of lecture 4 and try to answer these questions. The first question is this, give examples for the common traffic and transportation problems experienced in urban areas. The problems are traffic congestion, lack of mobility, yes. accessibility, disconnection in uh, transportation problems, yes. crashes and injuries. Yes, so. good. These are the common problems that are experienced in urban areas. Traffic congestion, lack of mobility and accessibility, disconnected transportation modes operating in urban areas and the problem of traffic safety involving crashes, injuries and fatalities. And the solution to these problems as we realized is planning, appropriate planning before trying to solve these problems. The second question is this, define the term planning. Uh, planning is a scheme to accomplish a particular objective. Yes, to put it more precisely, planning is the process of preparing a scheme or program to accomplish an objective beforehand. That is what we mean by planning. The third and last question is this, you explain the importance of planning in transport infrastructure development. Any response? Maybe I will answer this question. Any infrastructure developed in transportation system has to meet the demand for transportation over a long period of time, maybe for about 20 to 30 years. To get the basic input for the design and construction of these infrastructural facilities, we have to have some idea about the total traffic that will be making use of such facilities in future. This information can be obtained only through comprehensive systematic transportation system planning process. That is how transport system planning is very important in the provision of transport infrastructure facilities. Clear? With these questions, let us pass on to the conceptual aspects related to this course. As you might have perceived, 
urban transportation planning is an activity that has been going on for centuries shaping cities and the ways that community lives even so it is still part art and part science you may also recall transportation as a process is as old as the civilization of human being but here we are talking about transportation planning this has been going on in the civilized human society for centuries shaping cities and towns but still it is evolving more important it is part art and part science why it is part art part science because transportation planning is for the people who are living in the urban areas the behavior of human being cannot be fully explained using scientific principles and we have to take into account human behavior also in meeting their travel demand so unless you treat this process partly as art and partly as science you will not be able to satisfy the need in terms of mobility of urban dwellers later we will see in little more detail about the terms art and science of course uh, as new techniques are brought to bear the process improves more important they change as the needs of society change that's the most important aspect it's a changing process because the needs of society is changing on a continual basis let us try to define the term art now art is a product or process of deliberately arranging items often with symbolic significance in a way that influences and affects one or more of the senses like hearing vision and so on emotions and intellect that's the definition of the term art it encompasses a diverse range of human activities creations and modes of expression including literature film photography sculpture music and paintings have this definition in mind we will define the term science and then try to understand why planning has to be part art and part science let us try to define the term science science is a word which has originated from latin word scientia meaning knowledge it is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe testable explanations and predictions about the universe and of course a refined definition for the same term is this even though it is older still it is applicable and older and closely related meaning still in use today is that science is a body of reliable knowledge that can be logically and rationally explained now you know the definitions of the two terms namely art and science now can we just try to understand little better why transportation system planning process is treated part art and part science let us say as per the planning principle based on the predicted transportation demand 
in the horizon year. A flyover needs to be constructed or a grade separation facility needs to be constructed in a particular locality in a city. This is based on scientific principles. Any project has to get the approval of the society and the stakeholders. When the project is put forth, the reaction from the society is different. They feel that this great separation facility, if provided in this location, will spoil the landscape of that locality. Yes, the takes off the town or city in that particular place will be lost. We have to accept the emotions, intellect of the users of the facility and the planner should think of an alternative. There is no other way. And as per your planning, your transit station may come very close to a structure which is historically important. And there may be objection to have a station with artificial construction very close to a historic building. So that has to be accepted by the planners. These are all artistic views which should go into the planning process. And there could be a locality where you take your public transit service quite close to a religious place which will disturb the peace and other solemn activities of that area. And people might feel that it is not desirable to bring everybody very close to that particular place. So that is how we need to give provision to accommodate the emotions, cultural aspects and intellect of the urban dwellers in the planning process. That is why we need to understand that it is part science and part art. Yes, you apply scientific principles, decide on the travel demand, decide on the possible infrastructural facilities to be developed, but still it should be acceptable by the users based on artistic aspects, right? Then transport planning studies have been conducted in a large number of urban areas throughout the world during the past 50 years. Number of studies have been done all over the world in different cities. Though a process for conducting these studies has developed based on the past experience of half a century, it is still evolving which attempts to provide a systematic method for solving urban transport problems. It is very dynamic, still evolving and it is going to continue in the future. That is how the planning process has to be understood. The planning process that is most commonly used at present had its origins in the studies performed in several cities in the United States. They were the pioneers in urban transportation systems planning during the 1950s and 60s, particularly the studies of the cities of Detroit and Chicago are worth mentioning. Even today, planners refer to the planning record pertaining to these two cities to get some clue to solve the problems that they encounter. What is the fundamental assumption in the planning process? The fundamental premise or assumption which underlines most transportation planning studies is that some future horizon year equilibrium condition of urban area is a meaningful state to attempt to predict and evaluate. Or in other words, you must have confidence in the accuracy of prediction of the future condition of an urban area. If you strongly feel that it is not possible, there is no point in proceeding with the entire planning process. So we must believe that with the available information, 
available data, it should be possible for us to predict the future urban land use and transport system condition reasonably accurately. Based on this assumption only we proceed further. In the typical study, what do we do? The most probable pattern of land development is predicted for the horizon year usually 20 years ahead from the base year and the transport demands created by that land use or estimated or in essence we predict the horizon year land use. What do you understand by land use? The use to which land is put to is land use. Urban land space is used for a number of purposes, numerous purposes. And if you attempt to classify urban land use based on all the purposes that you come across, you will end up with 100 different types of land uses. But that is not our intention. We should be clear about what we really need in the form of land use as input to your planning process. It is enough if we just aggregate all these different types of land uses and classify the land uses on broad basis. Accordingly, the urban land use is classified as follows. First and most important residential land use, urban areas with predominantly residential use. Then commercial land use, urban land space with predominantly commercial activities. Then industrial land use, land space with predominant industrial activity. Institutional land use like government offices, educational institutions and so on. Recreational land use, agricultural land use. You may have some additional types of land uses depending upon the condition. For example, you may have land uses like just barren land or water bodies. So, these categories can be included based on the requirement. So, this is how we classify the different types of land uses in an urban area. Yes, please. Agricultural land is also urban land. Agricultural. Yes, uh, when we say urban area, normally our planning area for any town and city will be much larger compared to the area bounded by municipal boundary. The peripheral areas may have agricultural part, even forest land may be part of an urban area. Later on I will tell you how we delineate the planning area for cities and towns. It will encompass areas around a city keeping in mind the possible future development. That is how uh, this kind of category may be necessary. It may not be there in all the cases. You may have pieces of agricultural land, pieces of even forest land in hilly terrain and uh, huge water bodies, just barren land and so on. Now, while we try to predict the urban land use for the horizon air condition, what is our interest? Are we interested to predict the total number of houses that will be accommodated in a particular residential land use or total number of industries that will be coming up in a particular area? that is not our interest. Our interest is at the macro level, how the land use scenario overall will change in the horizon year is our aim or is our <coughs> requirement. Right? Keeping this in mind, I will show you an example of land use change in a particular city and give you some information about the macro level land use prediction. As you could see, this slide shows the land use change 
from the year 1981 to 1997 of Calvert County, Maryland, USA. And they have categorized the different types of land uses starting from agriculture, forest, low density residential development, high density residential development, other urban land uses, wetland and water bodies. You just compare the development or changes in the land use based on the color coding from the year 1981 to 1990. You can see there is increase in the area covered by low density, low density residential as well as high density residential uses, land uses. If you go beyond up to 1997, you can see similar pattern still further increase of low density and high density residential land uses. Some increase in other land use activities too. This is our interest. Take a overview and try to understand how the land use pattern will change. You can see here the rate of increase in the residential activity had been very intense at the southern and northern tips of this urban area. The southern tip initially in 1981 you can see with more of green patches. Now in 1997, it is almost full of residential development. The similar situation in the other tip also. Uh, this is how as planners we need to take a overview of the land use pattern change which will help us to understand the possible trip production and trip attraction rates in an urban area and decide about provision of mass transit systems connecting these major activity centers. Now, after predicting the horizon year land use, let us come back to the original step of predicting the future land use pattern. The next step is development of a set of alternative transport plans for that horizon year. These plans incorporate varying nature and amount of transport facilities you just incorporate different alternative plans in the planning process. And then you study in detail each of these alternatives, the operating characteristics of each alternative in the horizon year are then estimated in the form of flows on each link of the horizon year networks. For example, let us say you have identified two major activity centers in the urban area and you have planned to provide as alternative one a mass transit service connecting the two activity centers. As a second alternative, you are planning to just provide very good bus service connecting the two activity centers. Each of these two alternatives will have its own implication in the form of traffic as well as other environmental impact. So, look into these impacts carefully of each alternative and try to choose the optimal one. On what basis? What is the basis for choice of optimal alternative? It should be based on economic criterion. The usual criterion for choice among the alternatives is that the difference between the collective benefits to users in the form of reduced travel impedance and the money cost of constructing and maintaining these facilities should be maximum. Difference between benefits and costs should be maximum. Get the difference for each of the alternatives and choose the one which gives you the maximum difference between the benefit and cost, assuming that the benefits are going to be more compared to the cost in all the alternatives. That is the basis on which we choose the optimal alternative for 
implementation. And uh, to understand the planning process in detail, understanding of the basics of the systems engineering process will be helpful. Then what is systems engineering process? This is a process which explains the steps related to providing solution to the problems emanating from socio-economic environment. You can realize that is what we need. We also try to provide solution to the transportation problems which emanate from socio-economic environment. So, it is appropriate for us to understand first the systems engineering process and later see how these steps can be directly transferred to the transportation systems planning process. Let us look at the steps involved in the systems engineering process. First, as I mentioned, understanding of socio-economic environment which generates problems to be solved. And to understand the problems clearly, you must try to define the problems. Problem definition is a very important step in the engineering process. A definition of the problem as you could see here involves a number of steps starting from understanding or defining objective, then understanding the constraints, then having some idea about the inputs, outputs, value function and decision criterion. At this stage you need not have to bother about definition of each of the terms, we will see in detail about each of these terms a bit later, you just have a overview of the process as we uh, go further. So, after defining the problem, we generate a set of solutions, solution generation. After generating solutions, you analyze each of the solutions for their merits and demerits, understanding of the merits and demerits associated with each of the alternative solutions. Then evaluate each of the alternatives and choose the optimal one as I mentioned to you earlier, evaluation and choice. After choice of the optimal solution, strategy for implementation, recommended strategy. What do you mean by strategy? Why should we have a strategy for implementing a solution? Once you identify an optimal solution, you can go ahead implementing. What is uh, meant here by strategy? I will give an example. If your solution is to provide an eight lane divided roadway on along a traffic corridor to meet the future travel demand. The related question is this. Should we have to provide the eight lane divided highway right from the beginning or we can phase the construction process? Do we need eight lane divided road to meet the demand today? This eight lane divided roadway has been proposed to meet the travel demand that will be existing in the horizon year, 20 years ahead. If you are wiser in your economic management or financial management, you can just phase the construction program. You first construct a four lane divided roadway to meet the travel demand up to fifth year, let us say. Then make it into a six lane divided roadway, which can take care of the demand up to 10th or 15th year and subsequently widen it to meet the horizon air demand to eight lane divided roadway at the end. So, that is what is meant by a recommended strategy for implementing your optimal solution, which will help us to 
manage our finance much better because there are different sectors competing for scarce resources. You cannot divert the entire money for single project. So you must have some strategy for implementing any project. Then implement it and uh, the arrow gets connected to the step 1. This implies that it should be a continuous process. Go back and see the impact your proposal makes to the socio-economic environment. If necessary, make required adjustments and continue the process. Now let us try to define some of the terms that we have seen in the flow chart. Let us uh, define the term system itself. What do we understand by system? A system may be defined as a set of components that is organized in such a manner as to direct the action of the system under inputs towards specific goals and objectives. We have to understand the definition very clearly. We have a set of components in a system. Arrange these components in such a way that when you give an input, the output given by the system should satisfy the set objective. Okay? So that is what is implied here, specific goals and objectives. Then what is an environment? An environment may be defined as a set of all components outside a system, all components outside a system which both influences the behavior of the system and which in turn is influenced by the behavior of the system. It is uh, very simple even though it looks little complicated, it is not that complicated. You understand environment as again a set of components but outside a system. These components, what do they do? They influence the system as well as get influenced by the system. That is what is indicated here as the environment. For example, when there is a dense residential corridor, that residential corridor is the system for a transit line which is running through that particular corridor because that system or that environment acts as input to the system which is the transportation system. Obviously, the residential activity influences the characteristics of a system because when the demand is more you introduce more services, when it is less you reduce the services and so on. But if you are introducing a very good metro service along the same corridor it will change the environment. There will be more and more of residential even commercial activities developing on both sides. The environment changes. So that is how you must understand and appreciate this particular definition. An environment may be defined as a set of all components outside the system which both influences the behavior of the system and which in turn is influenced by the behavior of the system. Let us try to understand the term system in the context of urban transportation system with the help of a set of pictures. I am just uh, projecting a set of pictures related to urban transport. I want you to give a name for this set of pictures depicting different types of transport modes available in urban areas. Any suggestion? Simply you can name this as urban transportation system. That is what we mean by urban transportation system, putting all the available modes together, is not it? 
and uh, I am going to pick some of these pictures and put them together and you have to give some name for that assuming that set as a system. These are the pictures I am trying to put them together. I would like you to give a name for this set of transport modes in an urban area. Yes, please. Urban passenger transportation system, all passenger vehicles. I would like to emphasize here system is a highly flexible term used in different contexts to mean different things. Okay. Um, let me show you this set of modes of transport and could you suggest some name for this set? Urban goods transport system. Except the bicycle. Except the bicycle. Uh, bicycle is also used as a goods transport vehicle. Uh, we need not consider bicycle as only passenger transportation vehicle and uh, <coughs> people have a large carrier for bicycles to carry certain things on a regular basis you would have seen in commercial areas. <coughs> Any suggestion for this no, set of urban public transport system or you can say public transit system also. It is not really mass transit because we are putting buses as well as train together you can just name it as urban public transport system and uh, how about this set urban para transit or intermediate public transport system the Indian terminology equivalent to paratransit is IPT, intermediate public transport. Uh, Indian transportation researchers uh, like this term IPT, intermediate public transport modes. In this case all these modes together as a system. <coughs> Suggest a name for this set of vehicles. Yes, urban personal transport system. Now you can understand uh, the flexible usage of the term system. It is context specific. That is how we need to understand uh, the definition of system as well as application of the term system in different contexts. <coughs> in a broad sense, urban transport systems may be thought of as responding to the social and economic forces that exist in urban areas. I think all of us agree with this statement is responding to social and economic forces that exist in urban areas and this urban socio-economic environment in turn is influenced by the characteristics of the transportation system. Now this is the role of the transportation systems planner. The role of the system planner may be conceived in general way as a direction of his or her efforts to design a system that achieves maximum integration or degree of fit between the system and its environment. I think we have clear idea about the definition of the terms system and environment. We need to understand the terms system and environment in urban transportation system planning context. Okay. System here is the transportation system that we are planning and the environment is nothing but the socio-economic environment of the urban area. The role of the transport system planner is to get a good fit of the planned system 
into the socio-economic environment. That is the role of the transportation planner. Let us say one part of an urban area is predominantly inhabited by economically weaker section of the society. If the planner is uh, planning to introduce or take metro rail system through that residential area or if the planner is planning to have an elevated roadway through that area to facilitate cars and other vehicles to move fast. Will this proposal fit into the environment better? Metro rail is going to be relatively expensive compared to ordinary local bus or tram system. And when you provide an elevated roadway, it is going to be used by personal vehicle owners. It is not going to serve the local community of that portion of the urban area. So, the, there will not be any fit of a system into the environment in that particular context. That is what is meant by fitting of the planned system into the socio-economic environment of an urban area. You must understand the people, understand the socio-economic environment and provide an appropriate system. That is where uh, we are not paying enough attention. We just get carried away by the technologies and different types of modes being used in different cities of developed countries and try to transfer the system directly into our context, our environment, which may not work well in the long run. That is where this statement is very important. The planners have their role to see that whatever system is proposed is really fitting into the socio-economic environment of the urban area. And just let us uh, recollect the various steps involved in systems engineering process. This is just to facilitate continuation of our discussion to define the other terms involved in the process. So, this is our systems engineering process. We have now understood clearly about the system and environment and how to fit the transportation system into urban socio-economic environment. Let us now pass on to the next important step of defining the problem using different steps shown in this particular flow chart. We get into problem definition phase of the systems engineering process. The aim of the problem definition step as we know is to define the interface between the system and its environment and to identify a rule or criterion which may be used by the planner to identify the optimal system. It is simple continuation of our discussion. I said earlier the planner's role is to get a good fit, to develop a good interface between the system and the environment. Understanding of the interface can be done better by defining the problem. That is what is stated here. The aim of the problem definition step is to define the interface, to define the interface between the system and its environment and to identify a rule or criterion which may be used by the planner to identify the optimal system we are concerned about the interface, that is the role of a planner. The pertinent features of a system problem definition may be developed in a concise and unified form through the use of the following concepts as we have shown in the flow chart. The first important concept is system objectives. Second, system constraints. Third, system inputs. Fourth, system outputs. Fifth, 
value functions and sixth and last decision criterion. Let us try to understand each of these aspects or define each of these terms clearly so that at the end of understanding all the six terms we will have a clear understanding of the problem definition phase itself. In the context of urban transport system, it is appropriate to refer to the overall goals of the urban community and to the objectives that must be pursued by a transport system to facilitate the community goals to be realized. Our interest is just overall goals of the urban community. And of course, frequently the terms goal and objective are used synonymously, but for the purpose of this study, they are used in the sense in which they are defined here. We are going to have different definitions for goal and objective. We will define goals and objectives differently in this particular case. Let us try to define the term goal. A goal may be defined as the end to which a plan tends. Please uh, note the word tends, it is not reaching the goal, plan tends towards the particular goal. In this sense, a goal may be conceived as an ideal expressed in abstract terms that is sought after continuously and not an end state that can be reached. Are you able to appreciate this statement? It is just an abstract statement, right? Or an ideal expressed which will be sought after continuously. Let us say a person says, let us say Sharmila says that I want to be a rich lady in the future. It is just a goal. How much rich? What is the exact amount of money she is going to accumulate? It is not known. Just the expression of desire, right? That is how we need to understand the term goal. Goals may be thought of as a set of statements that attempt to convey to the planner an image of the ideal system and in this way provide him or her with overall direction, right? Just an image of the ideal system is perceived by understanding the goal in the planning process. There is no compulsion or it is not possible at all to reach the goal. You can just orient the planning process towards the goal. In this regard, it is to be noted that the urban community goals should not violate the urban policy normally set by the government. The goal that we discussed is nothing but the urban community goal. Each city and town will have its own goal for the purpose of developmental process. It is available here for most cities in developed countries. If you go and talk to the urban planner, he or she will be able to talk to us, talk to us about the urban community goal. This goal is evolved through the process of consultation with all the stakeholders in the urban area, business community, other stakeholders, government departments and uh, non-governmental organizations. All these agencies are consulted before formulating urban community goals. These goals need not be same for all the urban areas. It will be different for different urban areas because there will be specific local issues to be solved. So, these goals should not be violated 
by any developmental work that is happening in a particular urban area. These are just broad guidelines, but these community goals which are locally developed should not violate the national goals or community goals evolved at the national level. That is very important, that is what is stated here. In this regard, it is to be noted that the urban community goals should not violate the urban policy which is evolved at the government level. By urban policy, we mean the pursuit of a carefully defined set of goals, again goals in the form of policy. The overriding goals of a society are contained in its national objectives or goals. The terms are interchanged here. You can understand in this particular context as national goals. For example, traditionally these national goals include at least these aspects like freedom, social justice progress and national unity. These are all the broader goals or objectives set at the national level and this will be vetted by the political system. These are ranked in the order of importance in different societies according to the desires of their respective members as filtered through the political system. Unless a policy is filtered through the political system, you will not be able to implement the policy. That should be understood by the planners as well as local urban communities. You should not just be extreme and pursue some goal which is not accommodated by the overall goal evolved by the government at the national level. And to summarize, in this class, we started our discussion with the understanding of what? Planning process and we have defined a number of terms in connection with transportation systems planning. The most important terms that we have defined are the system, the environment and the goal. And goal is an abstract statement evolved by the local urban communities to express their desire in respect of the developmental work that will be carried out in any urban area. And these local community goals should not be violate the national urban policy like national unity, social justice and so on. We will conclude this lecture with this and we will continue the rest of it in the next class.